Um, so my name's Susie, and um, I'm going to probably talk for not more than half an hour because I really want um, uh, our conversation uh, to, to have at least half an hour for the conversation at the end. I see my input really as a diving board into having a, a further conversation because I imagine that a lot of you don't work maybe for a church organisation as such, you might work for a church, but I think quite a lot of what I'm going to say uh, has resonance. I hope it um, does anyway. So I'm going to dive straight in. Um, my context is that I work for CAPOD, um, the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development. So this is an official Catholic agency. So um, its mandate comes from the bishops, Catholic bishops of England and Wales. And um, the chair of trustees is a bishop. It's part of a global worldwide network of Caritas agencies. Uh, the people, the community that we work with in England and Wales is mainly the Catholic community. They're the ones that campaign with us, fundraise with us, uh, give us um, money and pray uh, with us. And many of our partners overseas are church partners, so we work quite a lot with different Catholic <coughs> diocese. But the people that we work with are not all Catholic or Christian, so we do work with people of all faith and none. <coughs> Uh, but here's the thing, so we work a lot with the Catholic community in England and Wales, a lot with Catholic partners overseas, but a lot of the staff are not Catholic or not Christian. So we've got staff uh, of all faiths and none. So in what way can you say it's a Catholic organisation? How does it live out that Catholic identity if a lot of its staff you know, are, are not Christian, are not Catholic, maybe not that interested in uh, the issues of the the Catholic Church. Um, here's me, looking rather fuzzy. Um, my job at Catford is uh, to work with staff, so that's my responsibility. I'm, I'm sometimes let out to go and uh, give talks to the Catholic community and to parishes and dioceses, but mainly my focus is on staff, and um, there are four of us in the theology programme at Catford. Uh, and when I arrived about 15 years ago, what would happen at Cathod is that the policy team would write a policy. So they'd say, right, we want to have this policy on how computers are made and that it's really you know, not serving people overseas, you know, the kind of um, uh, the way they're set to work. And they would write a secular policy and then they'd ring up and say, has a pope ever said anything about working conditions in El Salvador or something? And basically, we used to call it the Pope quote. So it was basically, <coughs> we'll write a secular policy, and then we'll ask someone from the theology program to kind of give it the imprimatur and say, well, you know, now there's a, and here, and we'll just end with a pope from a, qu a quote from a pope, and that makes it Catholic. And we've really, in the last 15 years, worked really hard to try and turn that around so that all Catholic's work is based in, in good theology, um, and that it's, it's, that way, uh, it's that way up. And I work with staff in two main areas. One is, as you can imagine, uh, helping them to work with the Catholic Church and to navigate that, and to know what an archbishop is and, and what a monsignor is, and to address them in the right way. Um, and the second area that I work in um, is really to encourage them to uh, understand Catholic social teaching, which is really important for CAFOD and is a systematic um, body of literature, really. We're very lucky that um, there's a lot being written by popes and by others over the years, and we have this systematic body of literature um, uh, which has um, a lot of richness and which lots of Catholics don't know about, um, let alone those outside the Catholic Church. But um, so that's, that's my role um, at CAFOD. So what does CAFOD say about itself? What, if you like, is in our, our shop window? Um, this is what we say, that our vision is a world transformed to reflect the kingdom of God, that we're inspired by scripture, Catholic social teaching, and by the experience and hopes of people who are disadvantaged and living in poverty, <coughs> and that we work with people of all faiths and none. And we live out, hopefully, lots of values, but... Um, in particular, these seven, compassion, hope, dignity, partnership, solidarity, sustainability, and stewardship. 
So that's what we say about ourselves. But I was interested in the question really of, well, who is inspired by scripture and Catholic social teaching? Because if a lot of staff aren't, aren't Catholic or a lot of staff aren't, aren't Christian, then can, they, can we say that we're really inspired by scripture and Catholic social teaching? So I was interested in um, giving staff of all faiths and none the space to reflect sometimes on scripture on, and on Catholic social teaching um, so, that it, so that there was some ownership. It wasn't just the senior management team, it wasn't the theology team doing it on behalf of everyone else. It was actually um, owned by, by others. Um, Lucy Winkett in her book, I think, has a very helpful analogy about bringing theology to life. So she draws an analogy between reading the Bible and reading written music. She says, we can imagine that the written words in the Bible have the function of notes in a musical score. The notes are written down on paper, there is an accepted language of symbols, time signatures and markings, translating the tunes that the composer has heard in his or her head so as to be understood and played by others. But sitting and reading the score of Bach's B's minor mass is an entirely different experience from singing it. The score only becomes music when the players or singers take it up and give it life by playing it. And so it is with scripture. So, and I would say, in Catholic's case, so it is with Catholic social teaching that uh, we've got plenty of words written by popes in great uh, documents quite long and sometimes needing translation from Vascon English into normal English, but that's all they are. They're words on a page. And how do you bring it to life? And um, I think Lucy's uh, analogy is a good one because you don't, you don't just want this. You want people to sing it. You want to bring it um, to life. So uh, I embarked on a something called a professional doctorate, which is a doctorate that you do on your work. You become a reflective practitioner, in theory, anyway. Um, Anna's also just finished hers, haven't you? Um, and what I was interested in exploring, really, was how do we know that we live out the values that we say we do? How do we make these values come to life? How does any organisational church, when they uh, we're talking about signs this morning um, in the poem about signs outside the church and what's the true one and what's actually the reality. And it's the same for any organisation for church, what we say we are, how do we know that we're living that out? And I used a research method called um, theological action research and I can't, I'm not going to go into great detail about that but just um, a few things might be helpful. Um, Theological action research, uh, one of its aims really is to enhance the faith community's theological capacity both in terms of words and action. And um, the authors of talking about God in practice, theological action research and practical theology, um, have this one sentence definition. Theological action research is a partnership between an insider and an outsider team to undertake, undertake research and conversations answering theological questions about faithful practice in order to renew both theology and practice in the service of God's mission. So uh, an organisation like CAFOD, this is ideal because it's, um, it's about action research but it's also theological. And one of the characteristics of um, theological action research which you might find helpful anyway to think about in your own context is that it says it brings together different theological voices. So, and they, they call them the, um, the normative theological voice, which is for CAFOD would be scripture and official Catholic social teaching. Uh, for your own, those of you from different um, denominations, it will be something else. It might, um, the Bible scripture would definitely be much more prominent you know, in some congregations. Um, the formal theology, the theology of theologians, so again for CAFOD, the theologians we might look to would be the liberation theologians, for example. Then the espoused theology, so the theology embedded within a group's articulation of its beliefs, that's what I started with, 
This is the shop window. This is what we espouse. This is what we say about ourselves. But it also brings together the operant theology, so the theology embedded within um, the actual practices of the group. So this is what we say about ourselves, the espoused theology, and our operant theology is actually what goes on. Okay? Um, and if you bring those voices of theology together, the theological action research authors will say that you get a theology of disclosure, that something is uncovered. And obviously for some churches and some church organisations um, that, um, that can be quite, well, they don't know what's going to, you don't know what's going to come up. And myself as an insider researcher, I was a bit nervous because obviously I didn't know what was going to come up, whether I was going to lose my job at Capon because all sorts of things were going to come up that were critiquing the organisation. The actual research project that I did um, I was involved in three cycles of theological action research, but the one that I used for my doctorate um, took place, as you can see, in, from 2012 to 2013. There were 11 um, staff, so very, very small. Um, they made up the insider team, and then the outsider team were three theology staff and one external theologian. Um, what I asked the practitioners, the insider team, to do was to choose um, a value from Catholic social teaching, like solidarity or compassion, one that they were interested in. They had to be passionate about it, otherwise I knew they wouldn't do the work. They had to go away and do some literature research about it, and then they had to do, um, look at how it interrogated their practice or not. Uh, and so they went away and did that. So they were like many researchers. They went away and did that, and they presented to their peers. Everything was recorded, and then it was reflected on both by them and by the outsider group. Um, so it was kind of a very iterative process. Uh, but what one of the participants said was like really important was the concept of ownership. That I didn't say to them, right, you do solidarity, you do compassion, you do sustainability. I said, what what value are you really interested in looking at? Go and research it and think about how it relates to your practice or not, or how it doesn't relate to your practice or, or Cathod's wider practice. So there was a real sense of ownership and there was a real sense of, of mutual learning. And I think what theological action research does is it gives the church or the organisation in this case a snapshot of itself. It's not complete but it gives itself a snapshot. And it is a snapshot that's sometimes hazy. It's not the complete picture. You know, that's, that's how it is. But um, it nevertheless gives the organisation or the church the opportunity to look at itself and look at the reality and look at the fact, oh, this is what we said about ourselves. This is actually how we are operating. And what came back in, in the research was really questions around Cathod's identity, and in particular its Catholic identity, and how it lived it out. Um, and I gave back to Cathod four recommendations about how they should strengthen or how they could strengthen the Catholic identity. And you'll see, you know, number one is not go to Mass, force all the force all the staff to, you know, partake in prayer every morning. It wasn't about that. What I recommended was that staff be given time to engage in focused theological reflection on Cathod's values, rooted as they are in Catholic social teaching. Values are something that everyone holds. In Cathod, they are rooted in Catholic social teaching. They have a, a, the faith roots, but people from all faiths and none can relate to the values. Give staff the opportunity to practice faith language, to talk about God in practice. So for some of them, you know, it's completely alien to talk about God. Give staff the opportunity to explore the tensions which arise from being a church agency. So for a lot of uh, people um, working, not for a lot of people working for CAFOD, but you might work for CAFOD and be very, say, pro-abortion. And obviously CAFOD would be completely against um, abortion as, a, as an organisation. So th there are tensions for people working for a Catholic organisation. They might not agree with everything that the Catholic Church um, says. Uh, and encourage non-Catholic staff to contribute to Cathol's theological narrative 
not just its mission. So at the moment, we let everyone obviously contributes to CAFOD's mission, but I was advocating that actually people of all faiths and none can reflect theologically. That's my experience. Um, they, they don't have to, you don't have to be Christian or Catholic. And people, because when you read a gospel story, I've heard it 20 times and I've got my own take on it. But when someone who's never heard it before hears it, they've got a completely different take on it. So there's a real uh, richness there. Um, and so just to give one example about um, giving people space to talk about God in practice, that this is really important for CAFOD because we're, a lot of people, a lot of the staff are communicating with the Catholic community. And if they use words that are alien to this community, they're gonna alienate, alienate them. So they need to be able to talk about, you know, our brothers and sisters, uh, or we're all God's children. They need to use that kind of language um, and, and not be afraid of that. But if you're someone who, who's from a, an atheist background and you've got to write something for the Catholic community, you're gonna be very reluctant because you've never used this kind of language before. Um, and yet it's very, very, beneficial to CAFOD if um, staff um, can, can get used to it. So this is one of the participants said, we all have to get comfortable with this. It doesn't matter if you're not Catholic, if you're religious, it doesn't matter what your personal beliefs are, but this is something we need to know in order to reach our audience and persuade them um, to act. Um, And another participant is that our directive is that we absolutely should be mentioning God more and more, and not just in the rent a quote thing, but integrating our talking about God. So really trying to get away from this rent a quote or rent a pope or rent a quote pope or anything like that, and much more about integration. I suppose integration would be a really in, important, um, important word. Um, because um, Quinlan, who's, a, who's an author from Australia, he says that any identity, but particularly he's talking about Catholic identity, is not something static, it's not something frozen, it's not something that you can say, oh, Cafford, Cafford's got his Catholic identity now, or Susie's done her research and we know where we are and that's it. Do I have to look at this again for another 30 years? He says that identity is something fluid. And if it's going to be fluid, you need to keep working on it. It's not something that, that you can just say, this is packaged, this is it. And so uh, I suppose what I am advocating, what I was advocating, was ongoing processes of theological reflection uh, with staff. Um, another, yeah, so sorry, just another quote from Quinlan. Interpreting the application of gospel values and the reapplication and reinterpretation of gospel values in never changing context must be part of the life of our agencies too. He's talking about particular Catholic agencies in Australia, but you could uh, replace that, um, the word agencies for, for churches, obviously. So another major finding of the research uh, was what CAFOD's operant theology uh, was like and luckily this was quite positive um, luckily I didn't find that we were like completely off the mark um, and what I found in Caffold's operant theology was actually um, that it was very Eucharistic um, and that it um, responds to God, it, God's invitation to love your neighbour as yourself in three ways pastorally, politically and in partnership. And again, I can't go into this um, in detail, I'm just going to mention it because it might be of interest. Um, but I found that CAFOD responds pastorally by seeking to accompany those who are on the margins. It responds politically by envisaging a time when rich and poor will sit down together at the same table and the values of the kingdom will have more power than consumption and violence and it responds in partnership through the mutuality of its relationships by being open to being changed and through the quality of its relationships which go beyond the telos of justice making. So, I mean, that's 
Cafod at his best. Obviously, it's not always like that, but um, that was quite, quite good to know. Um, so the thing that it demonstrated, that the research project, for me anyway, demonstrated was that normative theology, so scripture, Catholic social teaching, can be taught in a very creative way, in quite an inspiring way, in that it wasn't kind of very deductive. It wasn't, I wasn't giving lectures about this. It was getting people, it was saying, what are you interested in? Right, you go away and research, present to your peers, and of course all the other peers were really interested in what everyone else had found. And there was masses of energy, great release of energy, like balloons going off. And, um, and that Caffold is not a place of higher education, it's not a theological college, it's not exclusively Christian. But in this place, we could do theological reflection. Um, and in fact, it was, um, yeah, as I say, it released a lot, of, a lot of energy. So within the theological action research process, I think what happened was that CAFOD staff, those who wanted to, to be part of the project, were given the opportunity, opportunity to try playing the score of Catholic social teaching while also playing the score of their own practice. The result was sometimes harmonious, sometimes discordant, but it was music which had not been heard before. So the bringing together of those four voices, the normative, um, the espoused, the operant and the formal, I think um, really made for a, a great symphony which engaged and energised the performers. And since then, um, so that was a few years back, since then I've been asked by um, Caritas Europa so CAFOD is a Caritas organisation, it's in England and Wales, but there are 49 other Caritas organisations in Europe. And Caritas Europa asked me to lead, to head up a Catholic social teaching learning path for staff from different Caritas agencies from Slovenia and Italy and who am I looking at, Greece and all sorts of places. Um, they all came together for three three-day workshops over an 18-month period. And I was like um, basically sharing with them how to embed Catholic social teaching in their organisation. And what I found is that, that very few Caritas organisations had a theology programme, let alone had someone who was, whose sole job it was, was to work with staff. So I did recognise, we do recognise that CAFOD is very lucky. Um, being able to do that. And we were also very lucky, um, some of you will be aware that, um, in fact, the day after my Viva, no, the day before my Viva, I had to quickly read it, because um, I had to talk about it in my Viva, um, Pope Francis issued a document called Laudato Si, uh, which is about the care for our common home. But what's, what's great about it for me and for the theology programme was that he he, oh, it's, it's, it's addressed to every single person on the planet, but he wants a dialogue about what is development. And so we in the theology were like, okay, well, the Pope's asking for a dialogue on development, and we're a Catholic development agency. We really are quite well placed to, to, to contribute to this dialogue. Um, so on that basis, we went to the senior management team. We managed to get some money to go and the first thing we did was not start with the staff in London. We started with, by doing workshops in, overseas in different places um, like uh, Sierra Leone and Kenya and Bangladesh and Ethiopia um, and Latin America and we listened to our partners and our partners experience and then we brought that back and from what they said we then did uh, workshops with it was the invitation was to all CAFOD staff. Uh, I'm not sure. We did a series of like eight workshops and people would just sign up for whichever one they wanted. They were all the same. Um, so all, all staff were supposed to come to that. In reality, not all staff did, but it was sort of an all staff um, reflection really on Laudato Si, but also on the um, experience of our partners overseas and what they said about Laudato Si. So there's a whole big process uh, within CAFOD um, which, which needs to continue. It's not the end now. Um, 
because what we're suggesting to senior management is that we kind of change our model of development. So that, just, that doesn't mean just tweaking, that means a whole different way of working. So we're just at that stage, so I'll let you know what happens. But, um, so in terms of the way change happens, it, it, it's interesting. Um, but we've, ha we've had lots of open doors, so I think that really helps. Uh, very briefly, we're not the only Catholic agency um, that has gone through this kind of process. Um, there was an article by um, someone called Christine Tucker, who was the chief of staff at Catholic Relief Services, which is in the States. Um, she wrote an article um, in the Journal of Catholic Social Thought saying that Catholic Relief Services went through a bit of a crisis and was going to drop the word Catholic from their name. It wasn't getting anywhere. Staff morale was low. Um, and then they decided to do a whole kind of rejig and make Catholic social teaching much more fundamental so not just we believe in Catholic social teaching, but make it really integral to um, the organisation. Um, this, um, this was Ken Hackett, who became the executive director in 1993. And he said, we began to imagine what the world would look like if human dignity existed for all. Catholic social teaching was not solely a set of theological or, theological con theological or theoretical concepts. It became a practical framework for the beliefs we espoused. Catholic social teaching helped us to rethink who we are and what we do. Um, and this is now on their website. And again, I won't go into it in detail, but a bit like CAFOD, it's trying to embed and implement Catholic social teaching. So it's not just this is on our website or this is what we believe, but actually we don't live it, but it really influences who we are and the way we work. So I suppose for a church... That might be um, in scripture or uh, some of the gospels uh, might want, might, you might want to do that. So um, just finishing off then, um, in terms of embedding theological reflection in organisations, so one model that you could have is a bit like um, pilots. So the pilot is very much in control. He or she can choose the exact direction of travel the destination, when to take off and when to land, and others are literally on board, but are they on board in any other way? And it's very difficult, I think, in a top-down process to promote collaboration or co-ownership, and so any embedding may not well last beyond the flight. Um, so that, those are my own thoughts. I don't, I don't know, I'm not an expert at all in organisational theory, but just in my the little research I did, um, I did come across um, this theory U with Sharma who says that, that actually change is very unlikely to come from the top um, because, um, well, he, he argues anyway, that in larger companies, those at the top, so to continue my image, the pilots in any organisation, are usually interested in maintaining the status quo and therefore, if an organisation is looking for innovation and change, it's more likely to come from other parts of the organisations. And he says, leadership in organisations must be about facilitating and enhancing people's ability to see together, to deeply attend to the reality that people face and enact. And so what he maintains is that for change to happen, shifts need to occur at the bottom of the U. Reframing values and beliefs and reconnecting with the fundamental identity of the organisation. This shift in terms of the inner space from which a system operates, he says, can only be done collaboratively. So, um, this is my last slide. Um, so, in terms of embedding, uh, I would advocate um, that you do need leadership, but I'm... I'm not even head of the theology program within CAFOD. I'm kind of just one of the team in CAFOD. But I do think, um, I would say that I'm a kind of leader, you know, but I'm not, I'm not a manager. I'm not in any top echelons of anything. Um, and that has its advantages. Um, because I, my, the model of leadership that I would put forward is that of a conductor. So the conductor leads through accompaniment, 
It draws out from people the best they can give. The musicians have not written the score, so in Caffold's case, maybe the, the score is scripture and Catholic social teaching, but they bring their own interpretation of how the score can and should be played. I think what's worth remembering is that the conductor is nothing without the musicians. So the conductor can stand there and do this, but if the musicians don't, the musicians don't turn up, well, what are you? So the conductor really relies on um, the musicians' skills, their experience, their expertise. And the score cannot be played well without ownership on the musicians' part and their desire to make the score come alive, going back to Lucy Winkett's image um, and going back to also what the participants said about the process, that they said it, it, for them what was important about the process was this sense of ownership. And I think in them playing together, even if it is not always completely harmonious, collective knowledge and wisdom is um, maximised. And I chose this um, photo because, uh, to me, there's a kind of awkwardness in her stance. Um, and I think that's quite telling. I think um, it's quite difficult to be a conductor. It is easier sometimes to be a pilot and just say, right, everyone get off the plane and we're going. You can't turn the machine to autopilot when you're a conductor. Um, you need to maintain the passion. You need to be sensitive to those around you and you need to be faithful to the score. You can't go off and just... You can try and go off and compose something, but you need to return at some point um, to, to the score. So that's just a, a whistle-stop tour, and as I say, all, what I'm wanting really is it to, to just be a, a diving board into your own thoughts and your own experience.